morning, everyone. Is anyone new here? Yes. Oh, welcome. Yay. 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 Um, well, you came on a great day. <laughs> no, you really did. It's all good. Um, okay, so let's pray again. Lord, there is power in your name. You could just I could just stand up here and just say Jesus over and over again and just speak the name of Jesus. Just say Jesus. 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 And and there's power and that's that's all that needs to be said. Lord, I just pray that um, right now as we get into this, what I have so lovingly called my two million verses, um, I just pray that I would disappear into the background of your glory, Lord, and that you would come to the forefront. And it would be the name of Jesus that we walk away with today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're covering, um, we're in 2 Samuel, um, chapter 15 through 20, and we're also going to go through two psalms, Psalm 3 and 25. Um, This is why I called it a million verses. But we're not going to read every single verse, don't worry. Um, but guess what? We get to study more of David's tragedies today. That's why I said this is a great day to come, because it's all just tragedies. Um, no, there's good, there's good. Um, so I was struggling through this story again, thinking, when are things going to get good for these people? When are things going to get good for David and Israel, etc.? And I'm just like, I can't wait, like I've never heard this story before. Right? I, just kind of, I was like, I can't wait until the ending when there's no more pain or tragedy or struggles. And like, when are people going to stop being so messed up? And I was like, isn't there, <laughs> walking around the house complaining to Jeff, isn't there a, a happier story we could be studying in the Bible? You know, we're just a bunch of women. Um, and I started thinking like, you know, all the different other stories we could be studying. I was like, how about Abraham? Mm, that was a hard one. What about Moses? Mm, hard start. Esther? That was a crazy time. Ruth? Job? Joseph? Noah? Jeremiah? The time of the kings following David, many of whom were evil. The time, what about, what about the time when Jesus, what, Jesus walked the earth? And the awful state that the government was in at the time. Hmm. How about the time of the Acts and the Christian persecution? Peter, Paul, the disciples? Hmm. And then it dawned on me. Stop trying to find the perfect story. <laughs> it's just not going to get better. <laughs> As if I didn't already know that. People are a mess. Me. I'm people. And I honestly just didn't want to face it this week. This world is a mess. It's hard everywhere. Everyone has problems. Every story is pain. Probably didn't teach you anything just now. You already knew that. Um, so, I'm, I'm sure you didn't come in here with rose-colored glasses. Um, if you did, sorry. <laughs> but the news does get better. And as I was thinking about all of these stories and kind of just, you know, getting through it, and I thought, but wait, but this, this is the world. This is the world that God loves. All of these hard stories, all of these hard things. This is the world that God could have obliterated and started over with hoping for happier endings and better results. He could have. But no, these are the people. This Israel, David, these are the people that God chose to save and redeem. These are the people. This is what it's all about. These are the people that God chose to love anyway. That's the whole point of the Bible. That's why we study the Bible, even the hard parts, for this. Because the only goodness and there is, there is goodness, and we have to see both the good and the bad at the same time, right? Because they, all, they both exist simultaneously. But only the goodness through any of these stories, including your story and mine, is the goodness of God. Mm-hmm. We are these people. This is us. We are the people that God sent Jesus for. That's amazing, right? And the amazing thing is that God was already full of grace, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, hope, 
all those traits that are only needed when dealing with imperfection, he was already full of all of those characteristics when he created us at the beginning of creation. Those traits weren't invented at the fall of humanity just in order to try to figure out how to keep humanity around. They already existed in the full nature of God. So that's amazing. He's, he's, he was ready for us. He was ready for all of this. So yeah, this story has been breaking my heart um, and triggering some old hurts in myself. Um, and I'm, I'm also just like, way too empathetic of a person, almost to a fault. Um, and not that you shouldn't be empathetic because empathy is good, um, but I just can get caught up in the emotions and the feelings and, and, and good ones too. Like if you're feeling really happy, like I'm gonna be happy with you. If you're sad, I just wanna sit and cry with you. Um, and this is why I can't watch the news and I have to be really careful about what shows and movies I watch because um, I'll just be crying around the house all depressed and, and Jeff is like, this isn't even happening to you. And I'm like, I know, but it's happening to them and it's so sad. And that's how I've been reading this story. And um, so it's been hard to get through. And how many of you um, had a chance to like read through the chapters? Okay, so so you're following me, and if you haven't, don't worry. We're gonna summar, and we're gonna summarize it. But okay, the funny, ironic thing is that um, so Jeff, my husband, he's um, the young adults pastor, and they're also going through um, similar place. They're going through the life of David in the Psalms, and we didn't we didn't plan this. Like it just it just happens, and it's crazy. Um, so it's so, but it's been fun um, because we get to talk and share a lot about where we're at and what we're learning. Um, and Grace knows, she goes to Youngbloods and Kaya, and um, so, um, but here I am, you know, we're sharing about this, and here I am, you know, just depressed about the betrayal and death of David's son, and all the tragedies that keep falling on Dave, David one after another, like I'm hearing this for the first time, I'm just so sad, um, and Jeff is like teaching, he just taught on Monday night, on David's mighty men, and he's all into it, comparing them to like, well, this guy's like Chuck Norris, and this guy's like Jet Li, and these guys like, and so we were just like laughing, like, okay, this is the difference between between the way men teach and women teach. <laughs> I'm like, my David's son died. <laughs> I can't get past it. But the men, and they went to battle, and they were awesome. So, and he on Monday night I listened to it, and he he even like. He, he talked about this difference between us and laughed about us. Well, the sweet ladies at Bible study, they have to read about gruesome murders and stuff. You know. Like, so, <laughs> we are aware, but we bring each other balance. Um, but this year, our study has um, been a lot about big picture perspective throughout the life of David, because we've kind of been going through it fast, right? And there's a lot there, there's so many details. Um, so during the week, if you do have a chance to you, even if, if you can do the Bible study, or even if you can just read the verses, like it's awesome, because um, we do miss a lot of the details. But the word of God, this is the word of God. It's alive, and we can always go back to it and get more, because um, there's always more. Um, and then I love how the theme transparency keeps coming up, um, as and to think that God is transparent with us. And he does not shy away from giving us all of the ugly truths about humanity because in so doing, we can be all the more awed by his capacity to move and work and be good and stay good in spite of our evil. He, he stays good. And he is not touched by our own evil. David's story is tragedy upon tragedy. And that can really mess a person up, right? David's story is also full of collateral damage. And that's one of the things I was really stuck on this week as well. And like, what about Tamar and Bathsheba and what they went through? And a lot of his problems started because he multiplied wives. What about the wives? What about all the concubines he took? You know, like, I mean, and there was more. I mean, that's just some of it. So much collateral damage. Um, okay, so we have, so I am going to be summarizing, and what I really want to get to is Psalm 25, because this is where we are given the, voc the vocabulary to use during these hard times, when you feel like all you are doing is avoiding chaos, when you feel like there has been tragedy at every turn, when you have caused collateral damage, 
or when you are at the brunt of someone else's collateral damage, there's a good word for you too. I heard one commentator point out that this was the darkest time in David's life, and I agree. This is a very dark time for David. This was all brought on because of his sin with Bathsheba. What we're looking at is his collateral damage, and David knew it. Um, I don't know if you remember, but back in um, chapter 12, verse 10 through 14, when Nathan confronted and rebuked David for his sin against Bathsheba, and Uriah, he says to David, from this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah, Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all of Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against, sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for your sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, your child will die. And that was just the direct, like the actual immediate consequence of that sin. All the, Everything else followed. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. This is simply the law of sowing and reaping. God is the one who made this law and sometimes even takes credit for it, like here in the Old Testament. Um, and it may seem like God, is, like God is saying he's the one that's causing it, but the reality is that he set the law in motion, and he will not be mocked. Yes. He will, this law, you, everyone will be subject to this law and abide by it. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. You cannot commit murder and adultery and think that it won't be a disaster, um, and that many others in your family aren't going to get hurt along the way. Sure enough, last week we saw his son, Amnon, had raped his daughter, Tamar, then was murdered by his son, Absalom. And now Absalom is estranged from David. It's been years, years, lots of time is passing. They finally reunite, and then Absalom rebels and takes over the kingdom of Israel from David, forcing David to flee for his life from his own son. Then, eventually, Absalom dies a brutal death. So, picking up in 2 Samuel chapter 15, Verses 1 through 12. This is, and we're summarizing again. Um, this is when Absalom rebels and stills the, heart of, the hearts of the men of Israel. You can read all about his tactics and how he did it. He was very cunning and calculated. He worked on this for four years. He had this plan for four years that he was wooing the hearts of the people and turning them over to him. And then after four years, he took action, stirred up the rebellion, resulting in him being crowned king at Hebron. He even fooled 200 men from Jerusalem into unknowingly also being a part of this. And then the conspiracy gains momentum when many others joined him as well. Then, through the rest of chapter 15, we see that David, he hears that all of Israel joined Absalom in the conspiracy against him, and then he realizes he needs to get out of town immediately. So they leave, and he takes everyone with him except a few. Um, in verse 16, he left ten of his concubines behind to look after the palace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he did that. Um, then in verse 25 and 29, through 29, it says he sent two priests back um, and their sons back to Jerusalem with the ark. And the idea was that these men would be spies and send word back to David of Absalom's plans. And, and, that, and that worked. They did that. Meanwhile, keeping the ark in the city of Jerusalem for David to be re reunited with it again there. That was what his, he desired. And then he sent this other friend, his name was Hushai, Hushai the Archite. He sent him back also to kind of sneak in and be a fake counselor to Absalom to make sure that Absalom's plans go bad and that he gives him, you know, counsel. This was all devastating. All the while, David and his people are weeping and mourning as they leave. They're just throwing dirt on their head and they are... They are fleeing Jerusalem in 
complete despair. Then, in chapter 16, um, we have Ziba. He's the servant of Mephibosheth. And if you remember, Mephibosheth, um, he was Jonathan's lame son that David took in to care, take care of after Jonathan had died. And Jonathan was his best friend. Um, so Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, he shows up along the way, meets David, kissing up to him with a whole bunch of supplies and a false story that Mephibosheth, his master, didn't want to come also because he thought he had a chance to take back the kingdom if he stayed in Jerusalem. This was total slander. That's not what happened with him, and David does find out later. So then, from, um, from verse 5 through 14, we have this other guy. His name is Shimei, and he comes out, and then, you know, this is all while they're you know, on their exile out of Jerusalem. Um, he comes out and starts hurling curses and literal stones at David um, and his men. because He was still bitter about Saul not, getting, not having the kingdom. Um, and then instead of stopping him, um, stopping Shimei like, um, like David's men wanted him to, he didn't. David responded in verse 11, chapter 16, Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me. <clears throat> excuse me, bless me, because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road, and Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing as he went and throwing stones at David and tossing dust into the air. <clears throat> excuse me. So in verse 14, the king and all who were with him grew weary along the way. So they rested when they reached the Jordan River. Now, we are told in Psalm 3, like right at the top of the psalm, it says that this, he wrote this um, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Not all the psalms. I wish they were all labeled very clearly like that because it's really cool. It's like David's journals throughout his life. Um, <clears throat> but this one is given to us. And we don't know like exactly when he wrote this, and I don't even know exactly like how long their exile time was. Maybe you, some of you, one of you know. Um, but it was during his time when he was fleeing from Absalom. And maybe he wrote it here when he was resting by the Jordan. I don't know. So we're going to read it here. And he says, O oh Lord, this is Psalm 3, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying, God will never rescue him. Selah. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. Thank you, Lord, for another safe night. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. And he wasn't, he wasn't just saying that for effect. We know that. It was literal. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. This is war talk. Mm -hmm. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. Selah. So the rest of chapter 16 goes on. Um, Absalom, meanwhile, and all of the army of Israel, they, um, they have come in and, and taken over Jerusalem. He had just been king at Hebron, and now he's coming into Jerusalem, taking over David has escaped, and Absalom is accompanied by Ahithophel, this other guy. This guy used to be David's counselor, but traded sides to Absalom. <clears throat> so, but David's friend, remember Hushai, the archite, who he sent back to be a secret, a, a fake counselor, he also arrived around the same time in Jerusalem, and he went straight to the king, or Absalom, the fake king, to try to trick him with fake loyalty and bad counsel. Now, Ahithophel, um, had been David's trusted counselor, trusted advisor, so his counsel was um, taken as word from the Lord. His counsel was really trusted. And then he tells Absalom, hey, I got an idea. Pitch a tent on the rooftop, on your father's rooftop, for all Israel to see and sleep with all of your father's concubines. So they all see, and in there, and and then he says, then all Israel will know that you have insulted your father beyond hope of reconciliation, and they will throw their support to you. And Absalom did that 
quite possibly on the same rooftop from which David had lusted after Bathsheba. This was ironically the fulfillment of a prophetic punishment, Nathan gave to David. Crazy. David probably forgot about it, maybe remembered later, I don't know. So that was chapter 16. <clears throat> now in chapter 17, this is now Hushai's time to shine, right? He's there doing David's work. Ahithophel, he gave Absalom some good advice on how to attack David. Um, it would have it would have worked. It would have been against David. Um, but Hushai also gave advice, and it happened to sound better to Absalom, but was really in favor of David. Verse 17 says, For the Lord had determined to defeat the council of Ahithophel, which really was the better plan, so that he could bring disaster on Absalom. See, it was never God's plan for Absalom to be king of Israel and ancestor to Jesus. But the consequences of David's sin have been set in motion, and the collateral damage is just growing. But God was still in control of the throne and the lineage of Jesus. So in, from verse 15 through 29, or like the rest of chapter, 15, the rest of chapter um, 17, Absalom, we see he follows Hushai's plan, and he leads the army himself against, out against David. And meanwhile, Hushai was able to get the message back to David. Um, so he and his men were ready for this attack. Now, Ahithophel, the other counselor, once he realized that his counsel hadn't been taken, that his advice hadn't been followed, he figured his life was over, so he goes and hangs himself. Um, and then more supplies and support were provided to David. In chapter 18, this is the great battle between father and son, the death of Absalom. Um, <clears throat> this is when I cried a lot. David knew Absalom's plan and had organized his troops into three groups. And this is kind of interesting. One was under Joab and one under Abishai. And if you remember, Joab and Abishai were two of three brothers who were like just crazy. And they actually had... Um, avenged their third, their third brother's death with, and by killing Abner. Um, but, okay, so they were sons of David's sister. And I thought that was interesting. Every time, <laughs> every time that they're mentioned, and, and David had said in the past, like, like they, Joab is, is crazy. He's going to do, he's a crazy man. He's just going to do what he's going to do. Um, but um, every time David, like, refers to them, he's like, you sons of Zariah, you sons of my sister. He's like, he's just like, you're the son of my sister. I don't know, you're the son of my sister. <laughs> I thought that was funny. They were sons of David's sister, Zariah. Um, and then the other one that had a, had a group of David's army men was, um, his name was Itai, the man from Gath. And that just happens to be where Goliath was from. And so we, here we have you know, him being loyal to David. Um, so David wanted to ride out into battle with his army, but they wouldn't let him, seeing that his life was too valuable. Um, so he stayed back, but upon sending them out, he said to them in verse 5, And the king gave this command to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, For my sake, deal gently with young Absalom. Mm. And all the troops heard the king give this order to his, command, to his commanders. Joab was probably like, yeah, whatever. He probably would have beelined straight for Absalom and killed him if he could. And he did later. Um... It's almost as if maybe David was still hoping for some sort of rec reconciliation with his son. But at this point, it's just too late. He missed that opportunity a long time ago. And even though David never stopped loving his son, the damage had been done. This is what happened when this, this, these things happen. Loved ones become so self-absorbed in their own lives. The ruin of Absalom was completely the collateral damage of David's faults, multiplying wives, not having a good relationship with his sons from the beginning, not being a good father, and finally murder and adultery. And we're not blaming the sins of Absalom on David here. But sometimes you will be wronged. And the real challenge is to remain in integrity even when wrong is done to you. And this is something that Absalom was never able to do. So here we are. The battle was huge. So verse 7 says that David's men prevailed, Israel was defeated, and there was a great slaughter in Israel that day. 
As Absalom was attempting, that's good. He was attempting to escape David's men. He rode under a great oak tree, probably with low, crazy branches, and he just so he got caught like by his big, beautiful hair. Bless you. And his, he was known for his big, amazing hair. Like that was his, you know, vain pride. And he got caught by it. He's stuck in the tree with his hair. His mule kept on going, keeps on going, and he's hanging in the tree by his hair. And in all of its glory. And then guess who found him? Joab. And Joab and his men, and they all kill him brutally. The details of his death are in verse 9 through 18. It's very detailed. Um, but he died with no heir, no son. Then the rest of the chapter, um, the rest of chapter 18, verses 19 through 33, is about when the news was brought to David. And when the news was brought to David of his enemy's defeat, resulting in Absalom's death, he grieved hard. I mean, he was already in a bad place, right? And he, he didn't even kill the messenger. Like, did, were you reading this waiting for him to kill the messenger? Yeah. <laughs> like, I thought for, and I, kept, I like went back over it and like read it. Like, did I miss it? Did he, did, you know, he didn't. And like, but that's his thing, you know, like kill the messenger. With, you thought you were bringing good news. The king, ver, verse 33 says, the king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. And as he went, he cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Chapter 19, all of David's people, you know, they had fled for their lives, right, as war refugees. They chose to stay loyal to him in spite of the danger. They provided for him. They fought for him. This is his, David's entire family. He has lots of other sons and daughters. Um, but in his grief over Absalom, he had lost perspective, and his people couldn't even celebrate the victory. We're going to read that part a little more closely, too. So verse um, 1 through 8, chapter 19. Word soon reached Joab that the king was weeping and mourning for Absalom. As all the people heard of the king's deep grief for his son, the joy of that day's victory was turned into deep sadness. They crept back into the town that day as though they were ashamed and had deserted in battle. The king covered his face with his hands and kept on crying, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. I imagine he was grieving so much more than just his son's death that day. Um, he, the king had lost already so much between him and his son over all of the years. Um, and the, the tragedy and complexity of what this loss represented was far too great for David to bear. Verse 5, then Joab went to the king's room and said, this is when he rebukes him, we saved your life today and the lives of your sons, your daughters, and your wives and concubines, yet you act like this, <coughs> making us feel ashamed of ourselves. You seem to love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that your commanders and troops mean nothing to you. It seems that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died, you would be pleased. Now go out there and congratulate your troops, for I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a single one of them will remain here tonight. Then you will be worse off than ever before. So the king went out and took his seat at the town gate, and as the news spread throughout the town that he was there, everyone went to him. Dang, that seemed really harsh, right? This victory did not feel like a victory to David. He couldn't win. Not in any way. He wasn't going to win here. Have you ever heard of the saying, hurt people hurt people? Yeah. And David, in his hurt, was causing even more hurt to the rest of his family and friends and people who loved him loyally. The rest of chapter 19, um, after drug rebuke, David, he's regained perspective again and is now showing kindness and mercy. Um, David begins his return to Jerusalem. Shimei is sorry for cursing David, and he forgives him even though his men didn't want him to. David says in verse 22, 
This is not a day for execution, but for celebration. Today, I am once again the king of Israel. There's, there's our David. There it is. You can't just get over something sad, right? Grief is enormous. Um, and that's not what we're being asked to do here. But you can get perspective, and that's, that is what David needed at this moment, to refocus on the Lord. And hopefully, that renewed perspective does not have to come in the form of a harsh rebuke. But healing cannot begin as long as you are focused on the disaster. Mm -hmm. Healing can only take place when, like David says in Psalm 25, verse 15, healing can only take place when your eyes are ever toward the Lord. Mm -hmm. I do want to speak to depression for a minute because it is not just a sadness. Um, it's, depression is a very deep darkness that you cannot speak to on your own. Um, and it's not something that you can understand in someone else's life unless you yourself have experienced it. Um, so I do caution you on how you encourage a friend who is in depression um, or struggling in this area. Because sometimes, yes, it is just a perspective shift that is needed. Um, but sometimes, no. Sometimes a harsh rebuke is not the answer. <laughs> um, it, sometimes it's deeper and so much more than that and takes tender care and a lot of time. Your body is a whole holistic being, right? When God created you, he created you body, soul, which is your mind, and spirit. And they are all interconnected in your health, and the health of one affects another. Um, and so to treat one condition, you know, your mental health or your physical health or your spiritual health, um, without taking care of the others also, <coughs> I mean, it's ignorance. And that's not a truth that I was privy to until I myself went through it. Um, I myself went through a time of very, a very deep darkness that I could not speak to, no matter how many Bible verses I read, I couldn't, I couldn't just get out of it. I couldn't just, why are you downcast on my soul? Put your hope in God. It wasn't like that. Um, I knew all the right answers, and yet the darkness was there. Um, Susie Larson says, she's one of my favorite authors, what happens in your soul happens in your cells. And she has an entire book that I highly recommend dedicated to this topic, and it's called Fully Alive. Fully Alive by Susie Larson. And then in an interview that she was in, she says, we all have places in our soul that God wants to restore, but I think we've gotten so used to numbing out and to treating symptoms that we've not slowed down long enough to heal. Steve Arterburn said, the great epidemic of the American church today is unresolved grief. <clears throat> Every one of us has a series of losses, hurts, and disappointments, and we've not slowed down long enough to heal from them. Too often, the error of the approach of many Christians to mental health is, take two verses and call me in the morning. <laughs> there was a time when I was pummeled by clinical depression, clinical anxiety, clinical burnout, and a full-on identity crisis, all at the same time. Um, some of the missionary friends had helped us get to a professional counseling center um, that was specifically for missionaries and ministry workers. Um, and it was in Seattle, and we were able to stay there for three weeks. And I can tell you that I would not be here today if, I, if it weren't for that time, if it weren't for those three weeks. And during that time, I didn't just heal completely, but my healing journey began. And yes, I'm still on that journey today. And, it, and that was one of the most um, eye-opening things to realize, like, it's a journey, and it's okay, and, and it's a path and that's okay, and it's going to take time, and that's okay. And I still believe in God, and I still know God loves me, and I still know God is good, and I still hurt, and that's okay. Like, it's all okay. The very first thing that um, the director of the place um, had said to us when we sat down, the very first thing on the very first day, he said, God loves you, and he cares for you in healing ways. And there, throughout our time there, that was repeated over again. That was the basis of their entire ministry. God loves you, and he cares for you in healing ways. 
So I say that to you. God loves you, and he cares for you in healing ways. If you are in that place right now, struggling with grief or depression, I can't give you the whole healing talk right here. But I can tell you that it's a journey, and that Jesus is at the center of your pain. I was terrified to look at my center. Mm -mm, I wasn't going to look there. No way. And as long as I refused to do it, I knew I was avoiding the healing that Jesus wanted to offer. But when I finally let myself even just like peek, like at the peak of the center of my pain with like a half open like one eye, like really quick, I found that Jesus was there. And this is just what I thought was the center of my pain because it's so complex. There was so much there. But I found that Jesus was there. He was there right in the center of it. And he was tender and he was gentle and he was kind and he was understanding and accepting and agape loving and healing and in no hurry. Focusing on the disaster is different than from finding Jesus, looking at the center of your pain and finding Jesus there. May your eyes ever be toward the Lord. And if you do need professional help, get it. When you have a broken arm, you don't like rub the Bible on it. Like you go to a <laughs> professional, you know, and, and your body is, you are a whole being. Um, so... Continuing on, the rest of chapter 18. Next, David finds out the true story of Mephibosheth and how Ziba slandered him. And then David still, he, because of his renewed perspective, he shows kindness to both of them. And then he meets up with this other guy named Barzillai. And um, he was the one, he was one who helped provide rations and supplies for David and his people. And David shows kindness to him. Um, so then in chapter 19 ends with the men of Israel. This is, um, they're just in this huge bickering fight. <laughs> so the, the men of Israel, uh, gone through all this, and then the men of Israel, they're the ones who sided with David, right? And then the men of Judah, no, that was wrong. Thank you. The men of Israel sided with Absalom, David's son. The men of Judah sided with David. And they're just like bickering and arguing, arguing over like who gets more rights to the king based on who helped him more and you know, whatever. So they're in this bicker. And then um, chapter 20. And now we got this other fool, Sheba, trying to start another rebellion against David. And Israel, after that fight with Judah over David, they're like, eh, never mind. So they ditch David and go join up with Sheba in another rebellion against him. Um, like, what? <laughs> Do we really want you on my side? You're not even going to be loyal. Um, but David, in the meantime, he gets, back, he gets back to his palace, and there he deals with all of the concubines that he left behind for Absalom's destruction. And he provides for their needs, but they forever, for the rest of their lives, have to live in seclusion like widows until they died. So, dang, more collateral damage. These poor women. And I know they're not the main point of the story, but that's okay. What about their story? God sees it. He knows it, and he loved them all along the way as well. We, we don't just like get all their details here, but that's okay, because God knows their details. And he knows your details. And even though your details aren't the headline or written out for all to see, God, God sees them. And he sees you, and nothing has gone unnoticed. He sees it all. So in trying to stop the rebellion of Sheba... Amasa, this other one, and he was a cousin, um, he was proving himself unloyal to the king, and so he was brutally murdered by none other than Joab and Abishai. We should just call them the murder brothers. I don't know. They just like... <laughs> <laughs> you will be glad we don't read the details here right now, but if you like gore, then go ahead and read on, because it's all there. They hunted Sheba down, next, and then they found him in another town, um, and they were about to break the walls down of that town to get to him, and then the, instead, the people of the town where Sheba was hiding, they're like, wait, 
wait, wait, wait. They made a deal with Joab, and so they were like, you want him? Fine. We'll just give him your head. We'll give you, give you his head. Um, so they threw his head out over the city, and then they were satisfied. Um, nice. So that was, that was the end of chapter 20. There's a million verses. Um, so it's all happening just like Nathan told David that the Lord said, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me. David was forgiven for his sin with Bathsheba, but the collateral damage that was caused was great. And we see that over and over again. And now you really understand why in many of David's later psalms, he prays, remember not the sins of my youth. Remember me according to your mercy. Don't remember my sins. Blot out my sins. Because they cause so much problems. By the way, if anyone tries to tell you that the Bible is just a big fairy tale, <laughs> or Jesus is just, just a crutch and it's just a fake story, like for crying out loud, just read it. There is no fluff or fairy tale here, right? Tell them, just read the life of David. Like, that's not a fairy tale. Um, there's no happily ever after. Not here, not, not on earth, not humanly speaking, right? Um, I mean, we know the ending. We know that there really is a happily ever after. Like, we know that. But it is not here on this earth. It's not. And, and it's not this immediate thing that after you receive Jesus and you decide to follow God, that things are going to just be happy and great now. Like, that's a, that's a lie. No, I'm not going to tell you that if you follow God, well, then you're not going to have problems or troubles or sin. I'm not going to tell you that if you follow God, follow God, that you're not going to get hurt by other people. I'm not going to tell you that if you believe in Jesus and now you know that your sins are forgiven, well, now you're, that your sin's consequences won't also cause collateral damage. I'm not going to tell you that you won't be someone else's collateral damage, even if that someone else also follows God. Because guess what? We are that world. This is, we are these people. We are the people who are in desperate need of redemption. And we're all subject to the law of sowing and reaping. So what do we do? What do we say during these times when we just can't seem to catch a break? What is our vocabulary when it's like this? Because it's like this all the time. How can you even pray when you're just facing the consequences of your mistakes? How can you pray? What can you say to God when you are hurting unjustly? Where do you go when you feel like you are just turning from crisis to chaos? Are you just wishing for a different story? You may not be able to find yourself in these stories of war and murder, but maybe you have been hurt by someone close to you or a family member. Maybe you are the product of someone else's sin. Maybe you are just dealing with someone else's consequences. Maybe they haven't even asked for your forgiveness. They might never, but you still have to forgive them. Maybe there is no huge crisis in your life right now and things are good. Or things are mundane. Or things are just busy. How do you talk to God? As we read Psalm 25 right now, um, we're going to read through the whole thing. So if you have your Bible, open it up. Because I would like for you to underline some phrases um, that you feel like you know you need to learn to start using. And, and add this to your vocabulary. I have a lot underlined. And I'm going to read through the, um, in the ESV version. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. That's a good one. Here's my soul, Lord. I give it to you. It hurts. It's a mess. I give my soul to you. O oh my God, in you I trust. <coughs> Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Here's a good one. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord, forgive me. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Thank God. 
He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Are you doing good right now? Be humble. You will be led. All of the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. <coughs> who is the man who fears the Lord? Who is the woman who fears the Lord? She will, he, she will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, O oh Lord. <laughs> his soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. How many times can I say that? O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of his troubles. I love how David brings it back to Israel. David never claimed to have it all figured out, did he? He faced darkness and enemies and sin his whole entire life, to the very, very end. But he continued always to ask for wisdom, to ask for guidance, to ask for forgiveness. He had the vocabulary, and he's, he's given it to us here. Teach me your ways. Show me your path. Lead me in your truth. Tell God about your troubles and your pain. He can handle it. Life is complicated. It is messy. And yet, John in, in John 10.10 10 tells us that Jesus came to give us an abundant life here and now. We're supposed to have him. He's given us, us abundant life. Yes. How are we to live that abundant life when sometimes it feels like life itself can simultaneously be so depleting? Mm. Right? Only by being with Jesus. Because his filling is constantly, consistently, continually, only always more than the depleting at any given moment. It's always more. It's always more. It's abundant. Okay, we need to be with him to be filled. And you know, the coolest part, when I looked this, I actually just looked this up this morning, this part in John chapter 10, this is when Jesus is talking about, I have come to give them life and life abundantly. This is right smack dab in the middle of the teaching of the good shepherd. Isn't that cool? We just looked at Psalm 23 last week at our Quininia, and yup, he wants to give his sheep an abundant life. Eating in front of the enemies, laying by still waters, not afraid of death's valley, resting, satisfied, led and comforted, cared for with no wants or fears or worries. I think we could retitle Psalm 23, A Sheep's Abundant Life. God, see, God doesn't promise, when you come to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete all your enemies. I'm going to delete all of your hard things. He says, I'm gonna, you're going to walk past your enemies. You're going to still have your enemies, but I'm going to be with you. You're going to have victory. You're going to sit down and dine, even though they're there. That's the promise. He promises rest, goodness, provision, and abundance in spite of it all. In spite of it all. So my good friend, um, Rachel, her name is Rachel Jessel. She used to come here. She doesn't come here anymore. We love you, Rachel. We miss you. Um, she, so we have, so we have like this group text. Krista knows. Um, you know where I'm going. But, and we send each other texts of encouraging things and stuff. And she just so happens to text our group um, just something that she was learning and God was showing her and sharing. And she unknowingly wrapped up this entire message <laughs> just by sharing. And I was like, God, I'm like, so cool. Um, I told her I was going to quote her. I actually asked if she could just come and teach, but she said it had to be me. 
So, here's, so anyway, this is what she said. Um, and it was right in the middle of when I was studying. She starts off with this quote um, by Dallas Willard. God has yet to bless anyone except where they actually are. And if we faithlessly discard situation after situation, moment after moment, as not being right, we will simply have no place to receive his kingdom in our life. And then she goes on to say, my friend, this quote pierced my core. I feel like in so many ways I've been struggling to balance crisis after crisis. In a way, almost putting God on hold, trying to manage the moment at hand. Struggling to stop and allow the crisis, the demands, the to-do lists, the chaos, the rest, the good, the bad, all of it. Not seeking him enough as I attempt my best to manage every, every day. This was a piercing reminder that in the crisis and in the chaos, there was always the priority to stop and just be. To take Jesus off of the waiting list and just be with him. I want to always have a place to receive his kingdom in my life. It will always be the messy middle. The Garden of Eden, my life, heaven. Our lives will always be the messy middle. While waiting for this life to become orderly, running around trying to manage every crisis, I will have wasted precious moments just being with him, and that makes my heart so sad and so clear on what changes I need to make. I have this picture of me sitting with Jesus in the eye of a storm, and it's wonderful. If I step to my right or left, I would be swept away in the storm. But I have the choice and the freedom to just remain near him. So tenderly, he says, stay. Just stay with me. Let this storm pass. There will always be another. I will let you know when action is necessary. Right now, this moment is for you and me. Isn't that great? Dang, Rachel, why don't you just come? She doesn't even come to this study right now. She didn't even know how much that applied. But it's such a good word. And I said to my daughter um, last night, too, um, she was struggling with something, and my first thing was like, well, you know, you need to seek the Lord. You need to seek the Lord. I know, Mom, I do, I do. And then she came back in the room, and I was like, hey, I need to rephrase what I just said to you. I know I said to seek the Lord, but you just need to be with Jesus. Just be with Jesus. and he, Be with him, and he will lead you. He'll show you. But just be with him. This last quote by John Mark Kummer says, we, have, we just have to find the goodness of God in our actual life, the actual life that we have, not the life we wish we had. Amen. Just be with Jesus. All right, I'm just going to pray. I did have something in the song, but um, maybe I'll just, I'll just read it to you. Do it. Read it? Yeah. Okay, I'll read it. We won't, we won't sing it. <laughs> this is by Anna Golden, so write this down. Anna Golden, take it to Jesus, and we'll look it up. I have no idea what to say right now. How could any words ease the pain right now? Something like this will never make sense. Will never make sense at all. I have no idea what to say right now. And if you want to come, you can stay for a while. I know a place we could go right now. Pack all your pieces, broken and bleeding, all of your grief and doubt. I know a place we can go right now. When your questions don't have answers, and you just can't understand it, when your mind just won't stop running, and the tears just keep on coming, you don't have to explain it. He hears you before you can speak. Come with me. Let's take it to Jesus. All right, Father, we do that. We take it to you. We give it all to you, Jesus. Thank you that your name is power and that you are good and that we are the people that you came, that you decided to keep. We're the ones that you decided to keep, to redeem, to save, and to love because you already had it in your nature anyway to do that. We thank you for your love. Please speak to us and lead us and give us the right vocabulary through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.